good morning good afternoon and good evening guys everyone tuning in from various part of the world welcome i would love to welcome you guys here and uh, so this is a software testing reimagined series which we are doing right now this is part of a larger series uh, this is the second event which is a webinar we are doing the first one was a fireside chat and we have multiple events which are coming up and today's event or today's webinar would be about how whether company is even able to beat fragmentation and solve this. So we have our guest speaker Todd with us, who's going to take us through this session and uh, love to learn how he has been able to do it at weather.com and uh, he's able to scale it. Uh, now, before we start this session, few housekeeping items. So we would try to keep the session under 60 minutes. Uh, the session again is getting recorded. We want to make sure that you guys have the recording post the session and we've kept all of you guys muted so that you'll be able to hear Todd, but we'll make sure that you can ask questions anytime. And at the end, I would take up all those questions and uh, ask to Todd. And that is why there's a dedicated time slot in the end for 10 minutes, just for the questions part. And before we move uh, with the topic, I would love to uh, tell you more about how we as browse stack are trying to uh, solve the software testing problem for all the developers and QAs out there. Uh, a bit of a background about browse stack. So we started in 2011 and it's been almost 10 plus years. And today we are standing at almost thousand plus employees at a, uh, at a stage where we have more than like customers coming in from 170 different countries. So that has been our scale of operations across four global offices. Uh, we offer a varied set of products across web testing, mobile, and also, of course, giving back to the community in, with using free tools. And uh, in our web testing offering, there is live for manual testing, automated testing as well. And in mobile as well, we do help in solving app testing problems. Uh, browse tech scale, again, this number keeps updating every year, where right now we have 6 million users who use browse tech. Uh, for running Selenium commands, 72 billion Selenium commands get run every year and customers are tuning in across. As you could see in the Slido question as well, people tuning in for the webinar, we have customers across 135 different countries. So that's the current scale of operations. Uh, and uh, more or less, we have customers across all the industries. You can see across retail, across software, across uh, media, a lot of different industries we are able to cater to with around 50,000 plus customers. Uh, so before I hand it off to Todd, who is the speaker for today, uh, I would love to learn how you guys, as uh, when you are doing QA and development, uh, what are the different devices do you typically test on before releasing to any like any major feature or any release which comes up? So you can open up your phones or go to slider.com and just give an initial poll. This will help the speaker understand what kind of audience is there. So accordingly, he'll be able to pivot the conversation for today. Oh. We have the answers coming in. Awesome. So a lot of folks are saying that one to five devices there, but five to 10 is also picking up. There is a lot of folks in 20 to 30 and 30 plus. So out of all the people attending, 20% of the audience is testing on 20 plus devices. That is something very interesting. Awesome. So almost 50% is in one to five, but the rest 50 is five plus devices right now. Awesome. I have a good understanding of the audience. Uh, so presenting to you, Todd, who's the head of QA and DevOps. I think uh, he's no other person would be able to explain fragmentation as good as Todd can explain. He has been part of the IBM group helping through weather.com. He'll take you through the journey and explain you how he has done it. So over to you, Todd. Yeah. Thanks for having. Appreciate it. Um, let me uh, share my screen, and so you can see my presentation. Well, you got that now. Can everybody see that? Or yes. can you see it? All right, great. Uh, so uh, once again, my my name is Todd Eaton. I'm the head of consumer product systems uh, for the Weather Company, and we're an IBM business. So I will kind of explain a little bit about that and a little bit about myself, but today we're going to talk about um, fragmentation and how we have a couple of different frameworks and we have some strategies that we use 
at the weather company for uh, trying to beat fragmentation and and make sure that we provide our products to people of all sorts of devices and and different things that they use. So, with that in mind, um, my name is Todd Eden. Hi, once again, um, the the division that I work in is uh, actually part of Watson Advertising and Weather. Um, we're the consumer product system side or the consumer product side of the uh, weather company. Um, the, the consumer product systems group is made up of DevOps, content engineering, QA teams for products that you may be well known. Um, I'll show you a couple of them, but the, things like weather.com, wonderground.com, the weather channel apps. These are um, pretty big names in the US and, and a little bit outside of the US. Uh, I also manage the central security team for Watson Advertising and Weather. And we, um, we look out for our security posture across the, across the board, not just the consumer facing products that we have, but we have uh, B2B products that we use with uh, different industries like insurance, aviation, things like that. Uh, back-end teams, uh, just forecasting all the different uh, groups that make up um, Watson Advertising and Weather and the Weather Company. So what I'm going to talk about today is with fragmentation. I'll talk a little bit about the Weather Company and kind of give you some background because I think I'm going to need to explain that when we talk about fragmentation because our, ours is pretty varied just by the nature of what we do. Um, what fragmentation means to us, because um, I talked to a couple of different people about that, and there's a little back and forth on, uh, on when talking about fragmentation, so I, I kind of want to make sure we define it. Um, I want to talk about understanding your audience. That's a big thing for us, as we try to um, know who, what people have when they're accessing our products. Um, I talk about the issues found by fragmentation because there's um, can be quite a bit. And it depends on you know what your uh, what people are accessing uh, on or what, what they're using and the the different things that are out there. Um, talk about a little bit about our testing frameworks. We have a couple that we use and and how we go about um, testing different devices and browsers so that we can cover that. And then uh, just sum up and talk about lessons learned that we got over the years on this. All right, uh, the weather company, what is that? Well, that's your guide to understanding the outside. Um, we are the largest US-based weather information provider. Um, most people know us by um, our consumer-facing products, web, and mobile applications. I uh, talked about that earlier, weather.com, www.wonderground.com, the Weather Channel apps. Um, and we've got under the, the native native mobile apps, we've got other flavors of it. You have our, we have our flagship that most people are aware of, but we have things like the Wonderground app and we have a storm app that people use. Um, we have other B2B web and mobile applications that we use. Primarily, it um, can be used for TV stations, aviation, insurance companies, other industries use those. Um, and we help out in that area as well, uh, at least my team. I work with the various testers and developers in the B2B side uh, that have to tailor their applications to uh, some fragmentation in that, in that world as well. Um, the weather data and forecasting team, they primarily provide the data. So as far as a fragmentation discussion goes, they don't really have much in that vein, but how they deliver and where they deliver is something that we have to take into consideration. Now the weather company um, was originally part of, mo more pe most people knew it as the weather channel. Um, the weather channel, TV station, Jim Cantore, you see Jim Cantore rolling into your neighborhood, you know you're in trouble type of thing. Um, and there's a lot of people that, that understood that. Well, back in 2016, IBM purchased the, the digital side and actually the, the, the brand of the Weather Channel and the Weather Company. Um, and a lot of us went over and we became IBMers then. Uh, the reason for that is the 
data. I mean, we, the weather company has a tremendous amount of data. We have a tremendous amount of reach. And IBM saw that that was advantageous to their business so they could package that up with their products and, and support people on, um, and you see a lot of that in their, in their advertising when, when they talk about, um, you know, supply chain products and uh, assisting people with uh, various IT issues, bringing weather data and the, the weather company digital properties to bear with it is uh, quite helpful for them. So uh, consumer facing products, if you don't know um, the weather channel uh, or weather company products, this is what they look like. Um, primary one in the front is the the websites over on the left-hand side, and we have the Wonderground website and weather.com. On the right is the kind of how it looks on the, on the app side, at least in, from an iOS perspective. We have the, the Weather Channel flagship and uh, Wonderground. Pretty, uh, pretty common, um, but as you can tell with this for fragmentation, when you start talking about browsers and you talk about apps, you're really starting to talk about uh, a product. And when you have a product as popular as ours, fragmentation can get pretty large, pretty quick because we've got a lot of people that have multiple different uh, systems that they pull this up on, multiple different devices where you've got um, majority of people have Windows machines or Chromebooks or um, we see uh, different devices and different ways of, of getting the weather. And people are interested in the weather. Uh, this is how they figure out what to go outside. Um, we had an SEO um, uh, expert uh, or SEO resource here that he would always remind us that, that when he was doing his searches that are looking at the searches that come through that what people are really interested in is, you know, how hot is it outside? And will anything fall on my head? So when you look at that, there's people that can use any sorts of devices or browsers to try to figure that out. And we kind of have to be available for any of those things. So what does fragmentation mean to us? And you know, bottom line is supporting grandma's phone, right? Um, that's a that's a big one for us. We're the you know as I said before, weather.com is a top twenty website. Um, and kind of looked that up in a couple of different places. Um, the mobile app is number one in the weather category um, for mo mobile native apps, and we have approximately four hundred million. I think it's more than that now, but four hundred million monthly active users across the web and mobile apps properties. When you start getting into 400 million monthly active users, the, the types of devices and browsers that they can get to are, they can be all over. The big things that we look at, I mean, you know, when, when we talk about fragmentation we, and we talk about what people use, on the website, you know, Chrome, Firefox, Safari, and Edge, those are your big ones, right? And mobile, you're looking at for on the website, Chrome, Samsung, uh, browser and Safari. Not to say that's the only ones. When we do our reports on the types of browsers um, that are used in web, we, we can see a whole lot more than just this. Um, there are a lot of other different ones, but these are the big ones. And they get into the, and I'll talk about a little bit about the various versions. On the app side, uh, right now, the when you download the app, it's really supported on the last two OS versions for iOS and Android. You start getting any older versions than that and the, the application probably won't load properly or download properly for you. Um, but we have a lot of users that don't upgrade and that's where the fragmentation comes in. Um, yeah, I did, I did a, a poll on the report just before this presentation and I was seeing consistent users that are probably three years old, even longer, you know, a couple, you know, three to five years old. Um, we'll see people on that. A lot of people on the on the application side, they will update uh, a lot sooner. So it, it doesn't make it 
too bad, but you know, we, we do that. We tend to see that. And it kind of gets back to the title of that because we find that a lot of our older audiences, they will use a phone for a lot longer than um, normal. Um, you know, some of, we find that some of our older audiences will, will span across, they'll keep a phone and as long as the phone works and they kind of get what they want, they don't mind. And they kind of get to the point where they can't update it, but as long as it functions, they don't really mind if they keep an older phone. So, um, like I said, in the rankings, here's uh, SEMrush, um, which does a stack ranking. I just pulled out in the middle where we land. So we're number 19. Uh, this was uh, last week, I think it was, when I pulled this one. So not too, not too old. And then um, on the app side, you can see, yeah, uh, we're in the, the number one spot. We, we have been for quite some time. And, um, you know, we enjoy the, the support and the loyalty that we get from our user base and all our um, consumers that go to us for our weather information. So with us, you, you know, you see that breadth of the number of people that are out there and the number of users that we use. So what we try to do is we got to understand this. Who, who are these people that we're dealing with? And there's three primary ways where we try to understand our audience. Um, we use analytics, um, primarily on the, on the consumer side. Uh, we have beacons that we throw and uh, we'll take a look at that, uh, results from that. We have real user monitoring set up. Um, we use Instana for our uh, ROM and our application monitoring. And that tool tells us, um, you know, what real users are using and, and gives us that. Um, one that most people, if you ask them about it, they forget about this last one, but it is something that everybody uses. And that's just basic user free feedback. Um, we will look at uh, user feedback and, and we try to keep up with it. Like, uh, I mentioned in the next two bullet points. I mean, we review user feedback weekly, at least. Um, we'll get notified from our um, tier one support group if they start seeing trends. Uh, I've seen in the past where we may have something where maybe a map is not showing up properly on a particular device or on a particular version. And those, it'll show up in a trend just because there'll be enough feedback coming back that states this, and that'll be given to the proper groups to troubleshoot and and, um, and fix. So um, we review analytics and RUM primarily monthly. Um, I got some groups that look at it a little more frequently on the website for specific beacons that they're um, interested in. But from a browser device, what are people using? It's usually, the trends are usually show up on a monthly basis. Um, so they look at that. On the app side, yeah, a little less frequently sometimes because of you're looking for OS changes and um, OS version changes, big version changes. So they, they tend, to, tend, tend to be a little less frequent on that. Uh, user feedback, like I said, weekly, and uh, we have uh, meetings with our tier one support group on that, and uh, we go through those and drill in and make sure we find any trends or anything on that. And, um, you know, it's interesting as we progress through, um, you can kind of tell what things are are going to happen with it. So, so I, here's a dashboard. We use Amplitude for uh, analytics. And in this particular one, I just took um, page views. This is a web uh, web one, uh, page views by browser. And you can tell, um, you know, the different types of um, browsers that it's using and, and you get a real good feel for this. The, it's interesting though, over time, uh, I didn't include this uh, um, in, in the presentation, but we used to we used to track these separately, and we would see the trends. So, like uh, we got in a partnership with Samsung, and we were providing weather for Samsung. And I remember before that we 
hardly saw any Samsung browsers. And you see in this one, the top one that we have is Samsung Browser 15. Uh, it took a couple of years to show that. It would have been pretty hard to see that from our current charts, but we noticed that. And we were, um, if you know anything about browser stack, you notice that I think it was last month, maybe a month before last, that they added um, App Automate support for Samsung browser. Uh, I been screaming about that for about two years now with browser stack and asking them when you're going to add the Samsung browser to it. So it was great that they added it. And it's just because that's what we were seeing. We were seeing more and more of our people, uh, our users using that. But as you can tell in this analytics, I mean, they're, it's actually, you know, look at the numbers on the side, you're talking, you know, per day, uh, anywhere between one and a half million to nine million page views are in you know, you got 12 different browsers. And I didn't even list all the other ones because there's a whole litany of other ones below it. This is just top 12. And uh, it can it can get pretty wild on it. Um, this was Rum out of Instana. Um, point on this one, kind of the same thing. They do like the top five and you see the Chrome Mobile, Samsung Internet, Mobile Safari. Yeah, it, very similar to what you saw on the other one. The thing about this though is, um, this is rolling up the different versions. On the last one, it went by version number, right? So you had, a, you had the Samsung 15 versus Samsung 16 versus 14. On this one, they roll them all up into one. And you see that Chrome is um, you know, the number one that we have, but then Samsung Internet is a close second by, behind it and all the different versions and then Safari. Um, thing of note on here, it, the where this is showing up as well on the web side, we saw our desktop mobile traffic switch uh, pretty dramatically a couple of years ago. But I remember when I first started with the Weather Channel, we were primarily a desktop shop. We were like probably 65% desktop, 30% um, mobile, 5% tablet. Now we're probably 75, 80% uh, mobile traffic. Um, 15 to 20 of um, desktop. And then tablet pretty much stayed the same. It's still at 5%. Um, but in this one, you see the different groups. There's 37 groups, and I only showed a portion of them. But it, it gets pretty squirrely down there when you start getting into these other browsers because they, they do show up, uh, a Yandex or a, um, you know any other types of kind of weird browser will come up into the into the bottom half and, and we have to kind of look at them. Uh, here's the app one. Uh, app one gets even worse. Remember, we're rolling up. So you got the, it's the device model in this particular one. Um, we got 81 different device models. And this is just iOS. I just pulled out our iOS ROM dashboard from uh, last 30 days. And we have 81 different devices that um, are popping up in this. And you can see from this list, I mean, you got an iPhone 12, you know, the one, um, eight, five, three, that's all the, the version uh, or the model numbers of those. So, I mean, it, it can get pretty crazy. It can, it can get pretty wild on that. Uh, 81 different uh, devices that people are hitting our iOS app on, our flagship app. So what do we find with these things? And, you know, we got all these different browsers, all these different devices, and, and um, what are we seeing? And uh, this one, it's, it's our, my dev manager and I, we kind of tease about this because we just are beside ourselves with Safari. Uh, Safari is like the new IE to us because um, we're, we're finding these issues that are in fragmentation. And it's it's interesting to see it because um, um, they're based on these different browsers and devices. And there is a difference. Um, when you're looking for issues, there, there's two types that you're really going to focus on. That one is function at, or the functionality versus the visual, right? Functionality ones, they tend to be the more severe ones that we see. Um, they can be seen, they, they 
you usually in on the app side they'll go between device classes right so you get a you'll get an iphone versus an ipad um and they they really change up quite a bit between the two of them um we try to keep you know just one app we don't have separate um phone versus a tablet app so we have one that's responsive but when you flip over those different devices, we will see that. Uh, a lot of times our testing catches it. Sometimes uh, things get through, but for the most part, we can catch those. On the web, from a functionality issues, it's because the browsers are not accepting the same standards. And it, it's gotten, I want to say it's gotten better, but the, the difference one, the Safari one is the guy that killed me because I just remember it recently. Um, Safari doesn't handle regex very well. Um, the other ones do perfectly fine. So for Chrome and Firefox, and we just had an issue come out that, um, you know, it was pretty significant. It, it uh, caused an issue where we didn't have ads loading in Safari for a while. So, you know, for a couple of hours there, people got a, um, a, a premium experience using Safari because the ads weren't loading. Um, and that's important for our business so we can actually make money to, to um, be able to provide the products that we have. And it's, but it's stuff that we got to drill into people's heads that, yeah, there's this difference between these devices, between these browsers that the, that the developers and the testers need to be acutely aware of. Um, there's testing that can be done to catch some of this, and uh, I'll talk about that, uh, um, and some of the issues with that. But these are things that we have to make sure that the people that are dealing with this understand it. On the functionality issues, one of the big things that we see are click actions and the form filling. Um, that's probably consistent with most people. I talk to people in other industries. Um, I'm, I, uh, work in other uh, customer advisory boards and things like that. And that's a big one where between the browsers and devices is those things change up between the, the various things, uh, various devices and various browsers. Uh, visual issues, you know, it's design styles, right? And, and the, the designers, when they, um, they get the real estate, they actually apply different design styles based on the classes. Um, not so much on the website because of the browsers, but at least on the app side. Um, the things that we see from a visual perspective, a lot of times for us is um, overlapping uh, or bleeding text. Um, they'll um, bust out of a window or bust out of a form, that type of thing. Um, you know, not, not that it affects functionality, but it, it does make it a confusing um, experience for the users. So it's something that we yeah, are acutely aware of. Um, one thing of note, I was talking to some of the, the testers and some of the things they find, and one they brought up was the real estate issues on Android. Um, iOS, not as much, but Android phones, they they have like a, I guess they're, they're just, the different form vectors or the, the different ways that Android phones are, are built, they, they kind of have the wraparound screens on some of them. Uh, the flip and the fold are a couple of the common examples with Samsung. And, and those things, we got to watch out on how our apps uh, perform on that. And also on our, our websites, um, can they because they can look a little different and they you know, you might get these cutoffs because of the breaks and the, you know, like in the flip and the fold, the breaks and where they land. Um, it can can cause us a little bit of issue. Uh, localization is actually a big one. Uh, German language is uh, notorious for having these long uh, or multi-character, long character um, words in there that the wrapping will be, uh, will will may cause issues uh, where it doesn't wrap in the place that you would think it's supposed to wrap uh, or uh, might be confusing to people. That's one that we we tend to lean towards. We'll we'll do specific German tests um, just for that reason. And then we use some pseudo localization on that. 
Other one is uh, the non-ASCII characters. So you got your acrylic, you got your uh, Chinese, Japanese uh, languages, Korean, things like that. We look to that a lot. Um, we try to run specific tests against those languages because of um, just how they how they present themselves. And um, the different browsers and devices, while they, I, I can't say they, you know, they definitely handle it differently. We do see differences in some of those. And that's one that we um, try to be aware of. Uh, the last thing I want to kind of plug is the accessibility. Um, part of my role as um, the head of QA and, um, and over the products, uh, the consumer product systems group is uh, we do the accessibility testing and I work with an accessibility vendor to check our products for that. And um, each of the, the devices, so iOS and Android, they have different screen readers. When um, people that use a laptop or desktop, uh, Windows will have a different screen reader than a Mac. And, and those are things that we try to watch out for as well. We want to do testing in that area. Um, the testing that we do uh, on the website, there's some automated tests that we can run for this, but it doesn't pick up the visual as well. Um, for people that are no vision, not really a big problem. It's the low vision that we're, um, that we're after because there are different types of vision issues that people will have where they'll have tunnel vision or they'll have um, a takeover of uh, where they'll, they'll be unable to see um, like a focus or, or that type. And in those areas, we, we need to test to make sure that um, that our systems use the screen readers properly and they pick it up in the browsers that they're using, but also that the low vision people can uh, pick up the weather information that they need or, or the safety information that they can get. Because we do understand that our audiences rely on us to, to be safe and we take that seriously. All right, so uh, testing frameworks, we'll talk a little bit about that. Um, you know. It's basically trusting our bots to help us out in that world. Um, I, I kind of brought it down into three different types of frameworks we're using. Um, we have a design system. Uh, we use Storybook as our primarily one for web. For apps, we're, we're moving over to a different uh, design system because we're going through a rewrite right now. Um, but the design systems, it's primarily used to kind of help with functionality and visual. Um, if you know anything about design systems like a storybook or, or others, they test the module or the components. Not really a big one on testing page and page transitions, but those are those are good ones. I mean, it's these are things that we want to watch out for and make sure that the, the modules read properly and we don't have, you know, some of the things that we talked about before of the overlap or the um, wrapping and that type of thing. Uh, in a design system, you can set up pseudo localization. So we throw in a bunch of characters in there just to make sure that it's uh, working properly and it doesn't bust the frame or anything like that. So uh, it's actually a, a good test. And that's, that's part of the shift left, right? We're trying to get that as far left over, far left in the, uh, the uh, development cycle so we can, um, you know, get as many eyes on it and, and find things earlier so we can get them fixed earlier. Uh, functionality framework, that's primarily in the QA world. That's the, that's the big muscle ones, right? It's your Selenium, your Appium, your, you know, anything of that nature. Um, that's the ones we use. And we can run against multiple browsers and devices. This is where we really put the muscle behind it. So we'll have a suite, um, like I got a couple thousand test cases. We have to run against multiple locations and multiple time periods and multiple weather conditions. So, I mean, we can get into like 25,000 test cases or test scenarios that we run at a pop for a particular um, build. And in those, we'll run them, um, you know, we'll, we'll run the same test across the you know, multiple browsers or multiple devices and, and try to figure out where we're at with this. Uh, the last one uh, we used uh, is visual. I put down Percy because that's what we're using now. And, and you saw in the beginning, I mean, explained that's one of the products 
that BrowserStack purchased and is integrated into their systems. Um, so uh, before we used a shot, that's a um, open source tool. But so we've been doing visual regression for a while. And um, currently we're running on emulators, um, Chrome, Firefox, Safari, we do, you know, uh, desktop and mobile for uh, all those, well, not for Firefox, but for Chrome and Safari, we'll do mobile on it. Uh, interesting thing, uh, we had our browser stack review last week and saw that Percy is expanding into real devices. Um, short story on that one, when uh, I remember when browser stack was first investigating Percy, they asked us if we would kind of kick the tires on it. And uh, unspeed known to them, the first thing we did was we attached it to real devices in browser stack and it did not run well. I will tell you that. I think they, they have fixed it. We gave them, we gave them some pretty decent feedback if I remember right. And um, I think they, they, it took them a little bit of time to get that uh, together, but I think they, they got it cracked now. So it'll be it's something that we were waiting on for a long time is to be able to run visual regression on these real devices. Uh, and then we want to get kind of those, um, uh, those other specific devices. So we, you know, added to this, I mean, we got a couple that they're doing right now, but we want to get it um, expanded out so we can test the, the real devices that our users are using based on what we see in our analytics and our ROM. Uh, so for app testing, here's, you know, this is primarily what we do. Uh, you see, there's a couple of them. We do them all the time, right? And, and those are ones where we're running multiple times a day and uh, multiple sessions, your Pixels, your iPhone, your Samsungs. Yeah, there, there's a couple of them that we run. And then you see the steady state of these whole bunch of ones. And these are the ones that we run regressions against. And you see that, that whole litany of them. Uh, I did notice in, in the poll in the beginning, I saw somebody that had like, oh yeah, we test over 30. And for a, for a major release, we may do that. Um, we're gonna stick around about the 20 mark, I think just because of timing. We have so many tests that need to run against this. It just takes us a long time to run through that. But as you can see in this chart, I mean, that's that was based on our last browser stack review and you can see how many that we run against. And then on the app or on the website, they only, we only showed the top 10, but we have a lot more than these. Um, you know, you'll see a bunch of stuff that we run against, you, you know, you saw, you kind of saw where we landed on our, um, on our um, list of different devices or different browsers on the website. And you can tell that, you know, we'll, we'll pop it on the, the Samsung Galaxy and the iPhones are our big mobile devices. So we'll we'll concentrate on those. The other problem with this one, and this is out of browser stack, it would, we would do more devices, but there's only so many in the tiers. So you got tier one, tier two, tier three. And you know, if we're gonna use the the ones with like we're actually in public browser stack. We didn't do a private cloud on that one. We'll um we use the ones that have the 80 devices because we will monopolize it. We'll run against, you know, 40, 50 of them at a pop. And, and uh, that's why we have so many sessions on that. Uh, Percy is kind of interesting. So here's an example of one I, I did side by side because in, in Percy, you're doing a pixel by pixel view. Um, the one on the left is just our two uh, different uh, views of the same page. I wanted to show it and says, okay, here's what the pages look like. Cause we, we look at um, our pre-prod environment against our prod and see what changes. And then you see on the, on the right um, where it picked up on the, on the hurricane tracker and we're off a little bit. And what that does for us is it tells us, oh, you know, maybe we have a feed problem or something of that nature. And those are things that we want to watch out for. Um, and then this one is, you know, we're we're looking at our mobile emulator. But this is a powerful tool that we use, and we run it against multiple browsers and multiple uh, devices. All right. So lessons learned on this. Um, you know, the big one: know your audience, folks. I I can't stress it enough. We have been tracking our audience and their browser and device uses for years. Uh, I started with the Weather Channel in 
2012 and I picked that up probably 2013 and I've been tracking it ever since. And it's really interesting to watch um, the movement of it. And you can kind of gauge how your audience uh, works, but you need to know your audience because that's gonna help you out in skinning down your fragmentation. Uh, you saw the number that we're testing. Um, we, we support anything that's um, you know over 5% of our, our users use. And um, you know, knowing that and understanding that every month will uh, target your test properly. Uh, the next one is understanding browser and device differences. Uh, work with your dev groups and work. You know, talk about hey, you know, the, you know, we've got people that are using um, you know these browser types. What's the difference between them? And I, you know, we do have little sessions. Um, we have a um, a dev QA DevOps meeting every week. And we talk about stuff like that. It's like, okay, what, what differences are we seeing? Hey, there's a new version coming out. Is there anything new on that? Uh, update your targets regularly. That's what we do every month because we, we review it every month and we update our targets. Um, I'll give a kudos to Browser Stack. They, uh, we review uh, every month with them and they tell us the tier updates and things like that. So we're constantly updating our targets and making sure that they fit what we're after. And then um, set a decreed upon a support metric with, with uh, product. I, I talked about that 5%. That's what we agree on. I, you know, we, sometimes they'll come in and they may have a special partnership with uh, a particular device that they're trying to grow. And they'll say, hey, you know, we need you guys to check this a little more closely. And, and so we'll work on that. But um, you know, it, it's good to talk with product and make sure that they understand, hey, we're you know, I, I can't test all, you know, 89 different categories or 80, whatever number of uh, device categories we had, you know, I'm going to settle on these, is that good? And, and it, make sure that they're good with it. Uh, concentrate your testing on the supported browsers and devices, you know, that's uh, right along with it. And then last one is, you know, always check for your trends and user feedback. It's really valuable. You know, the users will tell you what's going on and they'll, uh, they'll, they'll let you know um, if they've got a problem with something and they will, you know, you can probably pick up where the different, you know, if it's a, a browser specific or a device specific issue and, and how to go about fixing it. So that is it for what I've got. Um, I think uh, I will, Stop my share now, and I think Naveen will pick up on uh, any questions that we may have. Hey guys, I'm back. I think uh, first of all, thank you, Todd. I think this was super helpful. I think for me as well, right? Being part of developer relations team here at Browstack, I think uh, we don't get an opportunity to get outside in view of how customers are facing that problem as much as like uh, weather.com faces like 400 million uh, traffic is huge. And uh, so we understand that. And uh, so I think before we move on uh, to the audience, I would love to uh, ask the audience, like considering the fragmentation problem, which was showcased by Todd, which is so grave. Uh, would you like to explore browse tag for your team? So that is something we would like to ask the audience as well. Uh, you should be seeing a poll question right now. So. Awesome. A lot of folks answering this question at this point. By the time a lot of people answer the poll questions, I would uh, start the Q&A for everyone here. So the first question is coming from Stoyan Petro. And he is asking that, what percentage of bugs you catch would say are functional issues showing only a, on a specific device? Yeah, the, the percentage of, of bugs for a, based on a, a particular device is probably pretty small, but the problem is huge. So I talked about that, um, that regex issue with Safari. Um, because that, I mean, that's like one bug and we probably, we probably find internally, you know, maybe 
uh, I want to say like we'll find 30 items um, between the various groups. So one out of 30 in that week. But that guy is the the damage that it could be done is so dramatic that it's not one that you can't discount, right? The the revenue impact that that guy would have, I mean, it could be a hundred thousand dollars if if it gets out in the wild and lasts for a long time. So um, those are things that we, um, while it's not a, a, a big number of bugs that are, hey, only this device has this problem. It's there. The impact of those are so big that you just cannot discount it, and you can't um, you you can't skip your your processes to make sure you find those things. And how is this? compared to like general functional issues that you see across devices, all devices. Yeah, th that's where the, that other 30 came from, right? So you got one out of 30 in a week, the, the other 29, it's, it doesn't matter what you're on, they're all gonna, we're gonna find those things. And when I say this, this is like, this is pre-production bugs that we're talking about, right? I'm not talking about escapes or anything of that nature. So, you know, in a, in a typical week, we'll find like 30 items um, that, that get bubbled up that are not in the in the scrum. They're usually found in a regression or found outside of a, a of a scrum. So most items they go across browsers and devices. The the problem the hang up that we got and the thing that I get beat up on I don't really get beat up on, but my my CIO and CTO uh, want to make sure on it is the stuff that we have found that are browser specific or device specific. Yeah, some of those are really, really expensive. And it, it is important. So, so when I go in with a business case and say, hey, I need a tool to be able to, to test this breadth of different devices, um, I got something to stand on when I go in and say, well, you know, you let this thing go out and if it, it could cause $100,000, that makes a pretty decent argument on it, so. Mm -hmm. Nothing arguing against an argument for $100,000 going out of the door. Uh, Anand Suresh has asked, could you please share more about visual testing? It will be helpful to know more about visual testing types and tools. And how will you analyze the test results and identify the issues? It's a packed question, so you might have to unpack it one by one. Yeah, yeah. So uh, a little bit more on the visual testing. So I. I brought up the the Percy um, tool that that's what we're using now, but there there are other ones, and, and you kind of have to break it up into web and mobile apps. Um, you know, on the website, like I said, there's there's a shot, which is an open source tool. On the on the native app side, um, you know, there's there's various tools. Uh, uh, I've, I'm blanking on the one we we're we're looking at it. I actually instructed my automation lead to look at uh, another set um, of uh, visual uh, regression tools with um, on the native app side. But in that world, what you're looking for is they do pixel by pixel comparisons, and you're taking what you're after is you're going to take a static view of a website of an app or whatever against your uh, update to see what kind of changes and the changes are the changes what you would expect. Um, because we do this on emulators, right now we're doing it on a desktop view and a, and a mobile view. We might muck around with the, um, with the screen size on that or, uh, but for the most part, it's, you know, we're, we're looking at Chrome, Firefox, Safari, different view viewports for all those, and trying to figure out, okay, is everything on the screen looking the same across these guys? And this new this new release that we're going to go out, is there any changes on there that we would not expect? And reviewing that daily, so we we run these tests every night uh, against these different environments. And we review the results every morning. Uh, well, any any differences? Some of it can get kind of noisy because if you're pushing out a release that's got some UI changes in it, you'll get a whole bunch. 
the, these tools, they don't know any better, right? So you'll get a whole bunch of, yeah, here's all your changes and you just have to go through and make sure, yeah, these are the ones, these are the things that we'd expect. Every now and again, we'll in, introduce a change and then the, the tool will pick up the diff and they'll find a visual problem that comes up on it. And the visual problem is usually, like I talked about before, the text overlap, the text bleeding, the breaking out of the frame, um, the, um, the where it doesn't cut off, the wrapping is wrong, um, things like that. And, and those items, that's what you're, that's what you're trying to, to, to find in there to kind of go back to development to say, hey, don't forget about this browser or don't forget about um, you know, this view. You're gonna to have to adjust your, your code to accommodate that. So um, you know, I'll probably remember tonight when I go to sleep, the name of the, the native app. There's a couple of native app ones, um, but um, they, they're, they, the, they weren't really, prepared, well, we weren't really prepared to take them on, but it's something that we're definitely looking at this year to kind of cover our bases. So our native app testing is, is similar to our web testing. So hopefully that answers it. Was there any other part to that, maybe? Uh, and how will you analyze the test results and identify the issues? Yeah, so those tools, that that kind of what I was bringing up with. So the Percy, the A-Shot that we use primarily on the website, they tell you, right? It, you saw that little, you saw the one that I had where it showed the tracking map and it showed the difference on that tracking map. Um, it'll show you where the differences are in the screen. And you look at it and you say, okay, is that something I would expect? On that tracking map, that wasn't something you'd expect. So we went back and went, hey, why are these, why are these maps different? Um, cause they were getting, it looked like they were getting from a different feed. And I think that's what they were updating and we didn't, we didn't uh, pick that up. Um, another one, you'll get this, like the whole thing will be red in red. The, the systems actually automatically pick it up. So you'll see, uh, hey, uh, the whole thing is all red. Well, what happened is you'll, um, this is where we, we caught it in the one where our pre-prod actually moved it down like one line um, or one pixel down or two pixels down and it just, messed up the whole page where not it didn't mess up the page but it changed the whole page enough where it looked like everything changed and then it was a matter of going in and looking and saying hey guys you added too much padding you got to reduce your padding because um it's going to cause issues for a device uh later on and and so there's some automation in there what it'll tell you and then it's some manual stuff going back behind it to make sure Oh yeah, this is what we see, and this is why they're having a problem with it. Got it. Got it. Awesome. Uh, Keys has asked that how can browse tag be testing on live devices? I mean, how does that physically work? I think a very curious question. How, how is this even happening? Well, I mean, that's up to you guys. Right? <laughs> <laughs> I don't. I'm not really the browser set guy. I use you, but um, yeah, I don't. You might want to, you might want to talk yourself about how does how does browser stack run against real devices and how yeah. what's the so, mechanism. Uh, so overall, answer the question. So, case we have a data center of thousands of devices which are running like a real phone, which you have right now, right? And then when you connect to a device on browser stack remotely, you're able to connect to that actual device. So when you're testing on browser stack you're actually testing on a real device, like the way you would test it on your phone. So the problems identified of fragmentation would be on how would your customers would be looking at it. So that's how it's happening. Um, but yeah, I would love to answer it further, but there are a lot more other questions. So, um, so Ed has asked, uh, do you test unsupported operating systems that no longer get security updates? And at what point? would you decide to no longer support these older operating systems? Yeah, the, the it, it, testing and troubleshooting are probably two different things. A, a lot of the older OSs that are, um, and it could be devi uh, devices or browsers, uh, any, any component of it, any of the older ones, 
we we normally stop at you know a, a agreed upon with product of how how far back we want to go. Um, some of them that don't have that, we still may get reports that come through that say, hey, my the biggest complaint that we get all the time is about the map, right? The map is, for us uh, on older browsers, the maps may not work properly. So we will review it and um, you know either use any device that we've got internally or try to find it, um, you know, the external version of it and troubleshoot it. But then after, if we do find it as a problem, then it's a product development uh, decision that says, okay, are we going to fix this or not? Because some of these products, they're not fixable, right? Or, or they, it would, it would take a heavy lift to accommodate it. And product may say, well, how many people do we have actually using this version of it or whatever? And if it's not not enough to move the needle for them, they may just say, okay, we're just going to have to answer these users back and say, I'm sorry, that's not a possibility. A lot of the times, our product people will ask us to give some kind of accommodation. So uh, on the map, we'll give like a um, we'll give like a a, a less fun a less feature rich map that the older OS browser might be able to use, um, but that's about as far as we'll go. Um, if it's out of compliance, there's a lot of times we just say no. Um, you know, we'll, we'll chime into product and say, hey, this is out of compliance. We don't want to. We don't want to provide support for it. And we usually get buy-in from product on that. Got it. I think it helps. So uh, there's another question from Anurag Grover. He's asking, can you elaborate a little more on the thought process on how do you choose to split your automation test suite for your primary devices or browsers and only regression test for the other bucket where the user percentage is kind of similar, but lower than the top devices or browsers? Yeah, yeah, that, that's the the determining what to test and and like what versions and what systems you want to put all your muscle on. That is that's a a group discussion that we look at. So every month, like I was talking about, so every month we're looking at our our analytics and our ROM, and we're trying to figure out okay, what are our users really using? Okay, what what are they using? And then we will look at what do we have available to test on? Um, so we will look at our internal lab and see what we have internally. We'll look at browser stack and what's see what they have available. Um, and then we'll look at you know any other uh, emulation or anything else that we can do to try to try to get to what our users are using. And we, you know, that that we draw kind of draw a line in the sand because you saw, you know, I got users using all over the place. But I, you know, if I took my top 10, top 12, that's usually the ballpark that we're looking at and say, okay, let's let's just do these ones. Uh, at, you know, let's concentrate on these ones. And then it's figuring out do we have the resources for those that we can run against? And sometimes we're up against the tier. Um, you know, browser sex tier issue where they may not have that particular device, uh, enough devices for that in it and have to say, okay, we'll leave this up for a weekend regression and then we'll get something as close as we can. Another one, we may just set it up uh, in the lab and run a suite against it in the lab. It will take a lot longer, but then at least we can flush out and see if we have any uh, issues with it. But the decision process is is really know what your audience has, try to tailor to what um, try to take your top ones that your that your audience are using, uh, be it browser or device, and then try to find your resources that you can test against where you're not going to lose your time. Got it. Uh, I think we have we are about time, but like quick questions. Uh, so Keith, so do you first check which browser the client uses and then in the code you act on that info yeah 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 yeah, yeah. um you know the the development team they they actually use the latest i mean they'll test against the latest the 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 actual developers on their unit tests and their storybook and things like that they're going against the latest browsers browser version 
we remind them in that dev DevOps QA meeting uh, on the weekly uh, basis, we remind them, hey, this is what our users are using. So they may throttle back, but yeah, they go into the code and, and it's important for them to use um, the browsers that our users are using. Got it. And last question is user feedback pipeline. Is QA on the front of that to vet incoming reports and filter out user errors versus escape defects or do you leverage a different process altogether? Yeah, so so for, is QA in front of the, uh, the user feedback? Um, we have a tier one support team that we've trained on user feedback. So they, they understand the um, user errors. And then when they review it weekly with QA and development, um, they may, if, if we find additional user errors in there, we'll let them know so they can add it to their run books. Uh, other than that, uh, QA is involved at like tier two, but tier one, they usually handle most of the user, um, uh, user error type of things. And they're pretty good about it. Awesome. I think those were the questions, um, guys, I think upcoming events as part of the series. Uh, so we have another fireside chat coming right in the next six days. So next Tuesday, this is the event. And then another webinar of evolution of QA at Gojek. So love to see you guys. I think on the top right, you can see the QR code. You can scan that as well as on the chat, you would have seen a link which has popped up, which you can use to register for the next events. I uh, would love to see you guys come and learn and like contribute back to the community. And uh, and Todd, from all the participants from the Browse Tech team, I would like to say a big thank you because uh, today I learned a lot and every one of us has learned that how big a problem fragmentation is and how do you solve it? So thanks a lot for this session. And thanks a lot, guys, for tuning in. Have a nice day, evening, and uh, see you again on the next part of the series. All right.